A Christian single mom of five in Oregon is trying to adopt through the state's adoption process, but she has been rejected by the state because she will not go along with gender ideology. Now she is suing the state of Oregon, claiming that they are discriminating against her for her faith. This is such an important story. I've got Jessica, the mom here, as well as her representation, Christiana from Alliance Defending Freedom here today. We are going to get into this and talk about why this matters and also the amazing things that God is offering already doing through her story. And then we're going to have a little bit of fun at the end of this. We're going to look at the ridiculousness at the Met Gala last night. We don't really care about it, but also it's just fun to make fun of these crazy people. All right. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use promo code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Jessica, Christiana, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, Jessica, we'll start with you. You're suing the state of Oregon for denying you the opportunity to adopt children because you're not planning on complying with the state's policy to respect preferred pronouns and things like that. Obviously, it's contrary to your faith. It's contrary to my faith. But I want to back up. Tell us how how you started adopting children and how you started taking care of children who needed a home and needed love in the state of Oregon. Well, I haven't yet, <laughs> but that's, that's the goal. Um, a couple years ago, I was listening to a focus on the family broadcast as I was driving into work mm -hmm. and it was a single dad who had adopted a son out of foster care. And I kind of thought, Oh, that's, that's really awesome that he did that. And then it was not an audible voice, but it was really clear four words in my spirit, just saying, those are my children. Mm. And, you know, try not to crash, got into work and just kind of thinking about this and praying and felt like God was leading me to look into adopting. And that was a little over two years ago, I want to say. Um, it's definitely been a little bit of a journey, but ended up looking into the state of Oregon, I had started for whatever reason, looking internationally. And um, I have five children. And my husband was killed in a head on collision about six years ago. And so I kind of started just an open dialogue with the kids, see how they felt about it. And we're praying about it. And we felt like we would like to take in a sibling pair. So not just one child, but we felt like we could help two out. And um, uh, this Columbia basically is kind of like, uh, we can't really guarantee that we would adopt a sibling pair to a single mom. And it was going to be, you know, pretty expensive to get started through the agency I was looking at. And I think just to adopt internationally, it, it costs a fair amount. And so then I just kind of felt like, okay, maybe I just need to look right here in Oregon and go through the state system. There's kids right here who need a family. Mm -hmm. So in March of last year of 2022, that's when I started looking into the states um, and starting their process and started applying and, you know, getting references and getting fingerprinted and going through uh, some of their training and everything. Yeah. And you're a single mother, correct? Right. And uh, several years ago, you lost your husband in a tragic accident, right? Yes. Yeah, I was so blessed with such a wonderful husband. And it's kind of funny because, you know, you look in hindsight, he and I, we had kind of talked about adopting a little bit, but just felt like, no, God's not really leading us to do that right now. Mm. And I'm just with the history of losing him and all of that and just walking through that with our biological children. I'm thankful because I felt like that was kind of God's mercy and just his timing. Yeah. He knows when it's the right time for everything. Yeah. And yeah, David was killed. We had record snowfall out here. It was crazy. And he was the manager of the radiology department where I work at in Ontario, where we both worked. And he could work from home. And so he was going to work at home that morning. And I had to be in for the early shift at 7 a.m. And so I kind of remember asking him, you know, which vehicle do you want me to drive? Which one should I take in? And he just, without hesitation, was like, uh, I'm going to drive you into work. I'm going to get you there. So make sure he gets yeah. you there safe. Yeah. And, uh, 
this man who had just brutally murdered his ex-wife was fleeing police and uh, chose to run into us head on at like 80 miles an hour. And David veered to the right, right before impact. And so he ended up taking the brunt of it and, and was killed immediately. I'm so sorry. And you, and you both have, you have five biological children, right? Right. Five biological children. You're left as a single mother. And I know maybe this doesn't seem like part of the story that's making the news, but just, I mean, on this podcast, we love to see how God orchestrates people's testimonies, whether it's through tragedy or through loss or through hardship or through mistakes or whatever it is. And so tell us a little bit about just after that happened. Obviously, it was devastating, shocking. I can't even imagine how you tell your young children something like that. But tell us a little bit uh, uh, what life was like after that. And then getting to the point of saying, I think I want to adopt more children. I mean, there's a lot that God would have had to do. Do in that interim period. Right. Well, definitely something like that will test your faith. Mm-hmm. It'll test what you believe to be true. Do you really believe it? And um, I love one of the analogies that my youth pastor used one <clears throat> Sunday sometime after Dave's passing was uh, this story that there was a mom who was dying of cancer and she went out to eat with her family. And after the meal, they said, hang on to your fork because the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. And just clinging to what the Bible promises us and what God says. And I have to confess, too, for that first year, couple years, I really got into apologetics. Mm -hmm. And that really encouraged me just to show how much evidence there is out there that what Jesus did wasn't done in a corner and it's not cleverly devised myths that we're following. Like it's true history. And he's, (laughs) and God has definitely been the one who has seen me through. I just know his grace has been around me. And it does feel when you have a loss like that, it does feel just like this void or this, you know, this surreal, kind of like a dream where you're waiting to wake up and it's really hard to believe it's real for probably for the first year or two even, but God has definitely been there and watching your children go through that. You know, I have two loving parents that I still have. Mm -hmm. So I, my heart still aches for my kids not having their earthly dad here, Mm -hmm. but also just encouraging them in their faith that you know, Jesus told us to pray, Father, he wants us to have that intimate relationship with God where he's the ultimate good father. So really encouraging them in that. And then it's like when he spoke those those words to me, those are my children. It was in that protective dad voice, like I love them. And it's like he let me just catch just the smallest glimpse of his heart for these kids yeah. and seeing my kids not have their dad. And then thinking about these children that don't have really either parent or because of, you know, drug abuse or other issues, they can't have that healthy, solid, grounding family relationship with their parents. Um, It really makes you want to do something because even though we don't have a physical dad in this house right now, I feel like we have a really loving family. And I think the kids and I could give a family yeah to some children who need it all right quick pause to tell you guys about my first sponsor for the day and that is quinn's goat soap this is a family-run company it is run by a 15 year old he's just very entrepreneurial and it's amazing stuff really amazing products that they make themselves from goat milk i mean it just makes your skin feel amazing they've got an amazing deal going on right now through mother's day the four seasons of soap so It's uniquely scented bars with four soaps and one shampoo bar for each season. So for summer, we've got tropical coconut and some others. For spring, they've got lemongrass. I love the lemongrass scent. And then for fall, they've got pumpkin spice and cinnamon. And for winter, they've got peppermint and frankincense. Um, The 11-year-old daughter, who's a part of this family-run business, Grace, she actually uh, makes the hand and lip balm. That's another amazing uh, product that they have. Now, normally, this package 
package is $120, but during this Mother's Day sale, it's only $99. Really great deal for Mother's Day. Add my code Allie, and then you'll get a discount. It'll be even less than that $99. Go to qpgoatsoap.com. Use code Allie for 10% off the total order. qpgoatsoap.com. Use code Allie for 10% off the order. qpgoatsoap.com. Code Allie. It just goes to show God's power, his ability to make beauty out of the ashes, to redeem any kind of lost or devastating situation. I mean, if you think about not just that your husband tragically died, but how he died, there's an opportunity there for bitterness, for resentment, for anger, for unforgiveness, for that man who made an avoidable, I mean, choice to, you know, make a decision that then ended in the murder of the father of your children and your husband. And not only have you, I don't want to say moved on from that, but you have begun to heal from that by the power of God and then use your faith to then redeem the lives of other people, hopefully, um, through adoption. And so I guess about four, it was four years after your husband died, I think, if I have the math correct here, that you kind of, that you are listening to focus on the family and you're like, wow. I want to take part of that. And then through the process, realize you are going to go through the state of Oregon. Um, did you assume at that point when you were going to try to adopt a child or be a part of the foster care system that it would be pretty straightforward? Like you would just kind of apply and then you would be a part of the process? Yeah. You know, I thought it would be pretty straightforward. And I kind of thought that the biggest challenge would be like making sure I have all the carbon monoxide detectors yeah. and good grates across the window wells. Like I thought it would be more stuff to like make sure the house is up to exact standards that they want. I, <laughs> I never would have dreamed it was going to go down this road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, tell us a little bit about the first speed bump. So you tried to become, was it a foster parent or adopt a specific child? Basically adopting not a specific child or anything. We hadn't met any siblings or anything just to adopt through the foster care okay. system. Okay. So that was your yeah. the, the first thing that you were trying to do. Tell me about the first speed bump when you realized, oh, this is not going to be smooth sailing. Well, so they have you take what's called a resource and adoptive families training, their raft training. And I took that back in June and definitely in July. Um, and one of the topics that's basically a full unit in that training is what they call SOGI, which is sexual orientation and gender identity. And they emphasize that you have to respect, accept, and then support children if they don't have, um, if, if like if a young man wants to transition and become a female, you're expected to take him for cross-sex hormone injections or for surgeries or for whatever step they're at or whatever thing it is that they're wanting to do. Um, you would be expected to take children to like gay pride parades or post certain flags wow. or signs in your yard. You would have are... to, so you would have to not just call this like boy by his preferred pronoun, so-called if he wanted to be a girl, but you would actually have to completely affirm and then go out of your way to celebrate this, you know, identity. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing wow. that, and that's where I finished the training and then I emailed my certifier um, in the beginning of August and let her know, hey, you know, <clears throat> the training had a lot of really wonderful things that I'm using with my biological children right now, but this Soji thing conflicts with my faith and I have very different views and convictions than this ideology that the state of Oregon is requiring requiring me to do and to accept. And it took a while to hear back, but that was basically the first speed bump is getting through the training and then letting them know, Hey, I have conflict of conscience here. And what was their response when you said that? Well, it took about two months for them to respond. And my certifier ended up calling me and, um, kind of just walking through hypothetical situations. And the one that she specifically brought up was, okay, well, you have a child in your care who would like to transition and needs to go have hormone shots. Will you drive this child to their hormone appointments? And I told her, no, I, I believe that our gender is something sacred. And yeah. not only that, I think I said, I, I think that's child abuse, that it's just, yeah, 
you're not affirming a person for who they really are, basically. Mm -hmm. And she basically said, well, we're basically going to pull your application and put it on pause. If you change your mind, then we can put it back into circulation. And I, and I even said, so in the whole state of Oregon, you're telling me there's not a sibling pair that doesn't have gender confusion issues or gender dysphoria that we could take into our home. And she said, well, that's, that's not really the point because Mm. even if we did allow that years down the road, they could change their mind and, and develop these issues. And you're not going to be supportive in, you know, taking them to these appointments and things. Wow. So, so she basically let me know that it was basically going to be pulled and everything. And then wow. about two months after that phone call, I got the official letter of denial wow. from the state. So you couldn't, they said, basically, you don't qualify to adopt anyone, whether they're newborns, whether they're toddlers, whether they're 16 years old, you are not qualified because you don't agree with the state's radical view on this, uh, on this idea that you can change your gender through hormone therapy or whatever it is, and you won't go to gay pride parades, right? Right. Yeah, that's what it came down to. And, wow. you know, they kind of make themselves sound like they're really inclusive, they're really diverse, and they want everybody to be involved and have fair access, but not if you don't agree with their ideology and if you won't, you know, in my case, if you won't violate your conscience to uphold the things they want you to uphold. All right, let me tell you about our second sponsor, and that is Freedom Project Academy. I don't have to tell you how colleges are dumbing down their courses to accommodate the average incoming freshman who literally, unfortunately, can barely read, and they're writing at a seventh grade level if that. And so everything is going to the lowest common denominator. You don't want that for your kids. You want your kids to be challenged. And so that's why I want to talk to you about my friends at Freedom Project Academy. They have perfected online learning, offering live on-demand and homeschool courses for kindergarten through 12th grade. Freedom, uh, Freedom Project Academy was built on Christian values and classical curriculum. They're dedicated to a mastery of the subject matter and teaching kids how to think, not only what to think. Save 10% on tuition when you enroll today at freedomforschool.com. That's freedom, F-O-R, school.com. Uh, freedomforschool.com. We can't hand over another generation to leftist propaganda in schools. So take back your child's education. Freedomforschool.com makes it really, really easy. Freedomforschool.com. So a lot of people in your situation, I mean, you've been through a lot. You have a lot on your plate just as a mom of five children, a single mom of five children. So the fact that you not only wanted to adopt, but you wanted to adopt a sibling pair, so more than one. But after this, I think a lot of people in your situation would have just said, thrown up their hands and just kind of given up. But you decided to keep pursuing this, right? Like when did you decide okay, this is not right. I'm going to figure out how to fight back against this rejection. Yeah, pretty much after the, well, after the phone call, I did ask for an explanation in print, you know, please, of why I'm being denied. And I kind of started looking for help, basically, and ended up coming across the ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom. And once I contacted them through just their online form, uh, I want to say it was like a week or less, they got right back to me and then they said, we're interested. And so I started, you know, giving them all the information and emails and, and it was kind of funny because I'd been praying You know, you're just troubled about something like that. And it doesn't sit well. I had um, a mentor kind of tell me she's adopted several children. And she kind of said, well, sometimes, you know, it's just tell them what they want to hear so that you can get kids out of the system, Mm -hmm. which I can understand. Like the ultimate goal, yes, that's noble. But it just, I was just so upset, I guess, about it, feeling it was so unjust that I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to fight it. And I had been just praying for a sign of God's favor Mm -hmm. in in all of this. And then that's shortly after I had started really praying that prayer. That's when ADF contacted me and started, you know, the process and saying, we're interested in representing you. Okay. So you had kind of made this public or you had reached out to them, you said? 
Yeah, yeah I reached out to him basically. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, Christiana, tell me about this lawsuit. Does the state not have the right to say, okay, you can't adopt if you don't align with our values? Well, the state of Oregon here is using an ideological litmus test, as Jessica explained. They basically welcome people from all cultural and religious backgrounds to adopt and to be able to adopt a child, be a a welcoming and loving home for a child who is a good fit for that family, unless you disagree with the state's gender ideology. Mm -hmm. And they're barring incredible parents like Jessica out the door simply because of her religious beliefs about marriage and about the human body. And that's that's, that's wrong. It violates the First Amendment. And so Alliance Defending Freedom is just privileged to represent Jessica. And we filed a federal lawsuit against the state of Oregon. And we've asked them to allow her to move forward with the adoption process while the case moves forward. Because what they're doing here is just a clear violation of her First Amendment right to not only speak her religious convictions and to say true things, but also to live according to her faith. And so you're the lawsuit alleges that this is a violation of the First Amendment. And where are you in this process right now? So we're still very early on in the process, just recently filed the federal lawsuit, and we're still waiting on the state of Oregon to respond. Okay, so you're still very early on in this. And what do you do during this waiting period? Is there anything that ADF tries to do to like speed things up, to get things going? Like, do you just repeatedly contact them or kind of (laughs) what goes on? Yeah, so we filed a motion for what's called a preliminary injunction, which is basically saying, the state of Oregon, what you're doing here is wrong. It's clearly wrong. And you're hurting not just Jessica, but vulnerable children who need a forever home. Right now, there's an average of 8,000 children in Oregon's foster system who need a forever home. And so we're asking the court to put a pause on Oregon's unconstitutional policies while the lawsuit moves forward. But I think the second big thing we're doing is just trying to amplify Jessica's voice. I mean, you can hear she's an incredible mom and she would make an incredible, safe and loving home for a child in the state of Oregon. Unfortunately, what's happened to her is happening to other Christian families across the country. Uh, We're hearing more and more stories of families from other states who are experiencing similar discrimination from their state organizations and barring them at the door from even being able to foster or adopt a child who agrees with their religious convictions. So this is an increasing problem. We want to raise awareness um, about this and help Christian families recognize that what's happening to them violates the First Amendment and there there are solutions. Wow. And it's just fundamentally anti-truth as well as anti-First Amendment. I mean, the entire idea that a child can even change their gender or that that's a good thing or that that is so important to a child's well-being that it's actually better for them to stay in the foster care system than it would be for them to have a loving, secure and stable home where someone is taking care of them. If that family simply says, you know what? God put you in the body that he wanted Mm -hmm. you to be in. And I'm going to affirm that. I'm going to love that. And I'm going to celebrate that. They actually want the opposite. They want someone who says, no, I'm going to approve of maiming this body in the name of an ideology that maybe I don't even agree with. It's 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 really, really sad, even beyond just the constitutional problems with it, Mm -hmm. just the fundamentally moral and truth problems with it. But you're right. There are several states that enact this kind of policy, and it probably goes unchallenged in a lot of cases, maybe because of what you said, Jessica, that some parents are just like, I'm just going to say what I need to say. I'm going to lie, which I agree with your reasoning that that's just not the route to go. Or they just, after they're rejected, they just say, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. And they don't even realize that there is an avenue to push back on this because they don't realize it's a violation of the First Amendment. Christiana, what is the kind of euphemistic language that these more progressive states are using to justify their policy? Are they saying it's like pro-safety, anti-discrimination, or how are they kind of casting their position? Well, the state of Oregon is casting it as supporting or accepting a child um, in their gender identity and gender dysphoria. But I think you made such an important point earlier. This transgender ideology is not only wrong and false, 
but it's dangerous yeah. and it's harmful to children. What the state of Oregon is demanding that Jessica agree to ahead of time before any child is in the picture is that she would take them to receive dangerous puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, potentially even life altering surgeries, mm -hmm. which just would, <laughs> it's tragic what they're doing to these young children. And so the ideology is not only wrong and false, but it is dangerous. And so that's why it's so important to have Christian families uh, like Jessica and her children standing up and wanting to speak truth and love and accept a child for who they are and help them see the reality that they're created in God's image and that their biological sex is a gift to be stewarded. All right, you guys know I'm a pregnant lady. And I'm like coming up on my third trimester, which means I'm getting very large, which means it's uncomfortable all the time, especially to sleep at night. So I really care about my bedding arrangement. And part of my perfect bedding arrangement, in addition to my all of the different pillows that I need for my comfort, is my sheet situation. And my favorite sheets are from Cozy Earth, especially because they're temperature regulating. We all know it's about to be like 125 degrees. And so being able to be cool at night, especially when you are growing another human, is really important. That's why I cannot tolerate any of my other sheets. I have to have my Cozy Earth sheets on my bed. They are so luxurious. They're made out of that bamboo viscous. And so they feel cool all the time. They're temperature regulating. And I just feel like I am in the most comfortable, coolest bed ever when I have my cozy earth sheets on. Seriously, if I have other sheets on my bed, I immediately can tell and I want to change them. That's how much I rely on cozy earth sheets for a good night's sleep. Plus they have loungewear that I really like, also temperature regulating. They've got amazing towels. They have basically just spoil me to the point where my standards for all these things are so high because of cozy earth. You can save 35% on cozy earth bedding right now. Another great Mother's Day present, by the way, cozyearth.com slash Ali. Save 35% CozyEarth.com slash Alley. I mean, it's pretty incredible when you stop to think about what this story really represents, that there is a state in the United States of America in which faithful Christians cannot adopt because they will not agree to potentially one day allowing their adopted son or daughter to either be chemically castrated or to get a double mastectomy in the name of gender confusion. Like that ideology is so important to the people in charge that they're literally willing to risk a child's, an adolescent's well-being on the altar of it. It's, it's really sad. What can just the average person do. Okay, so they're incensed right now. They're like, I can't believe this is happening. Whether they live in the state of Oregon or they live somewhere else, is there anything that like my audience members can do to push this case along, to push back against policies like this? Well, first, I encourage you to share Jessica's story, you know, being aware that these types of cases exist and that there is an avenue to legally push back against government overreach and state forced ideology is the first step. Secondly, if you're aware of other Christian families or believers who have been um, discriminated against by state governments because they won't bow down to the government's gender ideology, contact Alliance Defending Freedom. Let us know. We would love to have a conversation with you. Jessica, I'm so thankful that you are sharing your testimony. I mean, there's a, you know, Philippians 4.13 is very often overused and sometimes misused, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's kind of something we grew up saying, like, before soccer games or something. But it's a real verse that has real power. And I think that you and the way that the Lord has worked through you and worked through your perseverance is a real testimony to the truth of that verse. That looking at your adverse circumstances, anyone would have said, you know what, you just need to sit everything else out. You just kind of need to chill. You don't need to worry about what God may be calling you to do or extra steps you need to take. And yet through the power of Christ, you have persisted. And there are many, many reasons, many reasons, seen and unseen, known and unknown, why God preserved your life that night. But I have to I have to think that this is one of them, that God, the God of redemption, is bringing such beauty and such purpose out of a devastating situation that Satan meant exclusively for evil. So I just want to thank you for 
persisting and for using your testimony in a powerful way. Like we do not know how God is going to even use your beginning efforts right now to save and preserve the lives of other people, to bring people to himself. And so even if it seems like things are stalled or even if it's thing, uh, it seems like things aren't going your way right now, like I am very confident that the Lord is using this for his glory. And also ADF, Christiana, like I really believe y'all are doing the Lord's work by representing cases like Jessica's. So just God bless both of you. And Jessica, if there's anything else that you want to say that you want to end on, please say it. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, it's funny because when you, you live through something like, you know, after losing Dave and everything, part of you sometimes questions, you know, do I really have to be here, God? Like I'm ready to go home too. Right. But that's right. been the prayer of my heart is, God, if you can still use me to help people to wake up to you and to know you and to come to salvation, okay, I'm all in. <laughs> and one of the verses, oh, I'm going to forget, it's, I think it's Psalm 126 or 26 at the end, and I believe it's David, but he says, I'm confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes. Uh, be yeah. strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And yes. so I feel like that's, yeah. Um, a piece of scripture that's been really meaningful and I'm just <laughs> trusting him. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your faith. It's a testimony for all of us. And Christiana, thank you so much too. I do encourage people um, to support ADF and to, if you've got a story similar to Jessica's to reach out to ADF too. Thank you so much, Christiana. And thank you both for taking the time to come on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Last sponsor for the day is Eden Pure. So if you need an air purifier in your home, you've got pets, maybe you just moved into a new home, there's like cigarette smell, a smell or like other people's pets, or maybe you've got a bunch of kids and so you're trying to get rid of that dirty diaper smell or you just want to make sure that your air is clear of bacteria and viruses and things like that, then you need to try out the Thunderstorm Air Purifier by Eden Pure. Right now, if you buy one Thunderstorm, You can get one for free, and it's a really, really good deal because these things can be super expensive, but this deal makes it really affordable. And the thunderstorm, you just plug right into your wall. You don't even see it. It's totally seamless, and then it works using O3 technology to take all those bad things out of the air. You can even travel with it. It's that light. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Use discount code Allie for that BOGO deal. EdenPureDeals.com. Use discount code Allie. That's EdenPureDeals.com, code Allie. Okay, we're just going to quickly go through some of these outfits from the Met Gala last night. Brie, I don't even know what the Met Gala is, to be honest. What do they do after they walk the carpet and then go inside? I think it's like a fundraising event. For the Met. For the Met, I think. (laughs) Okay, so do they go inside and look at art? Yeah, I think there's like a whole display of like the the the... I don't know, the outfits from the theme or something. It's okay. I don't, what I was don't know. the theme of last night? So last night's theme was Carl Lagerfeld. No who, idea. He was the creative director of Chanel and he died, I guess, pretty recently. Okay. And so it was just like honoring his honoring fashion. Him. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's look at some of them. Uh, first, let's look at the first picture. So we've got Kim K and her servant in the background. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So we've got some beads, some beading. Yeah, a nice little corset. There. A nice little corset. I remember people were so mad because she was wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress like a yeah. few years ago and like ripped it, which is so disrespectful. Um, okay, from a, I mean, Met Gala is not about necessarily looking just like beautiful. It's mm-hmm. about like meeting the theme and looking a little weird. Yep. So, and I have no idea who this director was, so I have no idea if this is like an accurate representation. Just think Chanel, what you know of Chanel, I think. Which is like nothing, (laughs) maybe the perfume. Um, Okay, rating one through 10. This is definitely not the worst I've seen her in, 10 being the best. I would maybe go with like a seven. She looks pretty. I'd say five. Five? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) I was too generous. Okay, let's look at Emma Chamberlain. This is like a, this is a YouTuber who has Mm -hmm. become insanely famous. Okay, (laughs) sure. I don't know. Is socks with heels, that's a thing right now. I've seen that. (laughs) You've seen that? Yeah, I've seen that. 
I hate this, but <laughs> you hate it. Okay, and I okay, so I like this color on her. I actually love this color in general. Her makeup is really dark compared mm-hmm. to the light blue. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I do like the color also. Yeah. Okay, I'll rate this <sighs> a four and a half. What would you say? I'd say three. Okay. Well, no, that's to, I'll I'll say four because there's worse. There's worse. Okay, <laughs> let's see Pedro Pascal. Hate, hate, <laughs> hate. He looks like a twelve-year-old Satan. <laughs> He's they... wearing shorts, which no man should ever do if you're not at the beach or pool after the age of twelve. Mm-mm. No, you're right. And or someone running. someone told him this would be a good idea, and that offends me. Yes. So for those of you who are listening, he's wearing a red and black combo, which, again, is like really only appropriate in certain cases if you are Beelzebub is one of the circumstances. (laughs) But he's wearing like crew socks, weird dress shoes, a red trench coat, black like trouser shorts that are, I don't know, seven inches above his knee. Red shirt, black tie, slicked back hair. I mean, he's a very, if I if I can say, just objectively speaking, a very attractive man, but this looks awful. Yeah. No, Terrible. agreed. It's not good, but everyone loves him, so he can get away with it, I guess. Yeah, 1.9 for me. <laughs> Specific. I'll go yeah. two. Oh. I'll round whoa. it up. Okay. Um, I might have to skip some. What? Looking at the list, what do you think is most important to look at? Who's this? This is Bad Bunny, which look. Bad Bunny? I thought Bad Bunny was a woman. <laughs> no, you're probably mixing that up with someone else. This is Bad Bunny. But Kayla, show the other picture because this looks normal until, until... Uh, until you see the back. Oh, disgusting. Okay, again, this is like womanly. Yeah. He's got he's wearing like a backwards necklace and like the back of his outfit is cut out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um so maybe just... I was thinking of Doja Cat. Maybe is Doja Cat <laughs> a woman? Yes, okay, Doja Cat's let's a woman. See Doja Cat. Oh, wait, let me rate that. The front is better than Pedro's. So two it's in the two because the cutout in the back is so disgusting. Uh-huh. I would say two point seven. Okay. I'll do three. Okay. <laughs> okay i guess i was thinking of doja cat bad bunny same kind of deal um okay is yeah. there another picture you're gonna want to look close up at this one she's wearing cat ears for those listening she's- oh no <laughs> so she has okay this she got the same makeup artist that they use for jumanji <laughs> when the little boy turns into the a monkey, monkey yeah. you know what i'm talking about it's yeah. the same deal <laughs> so they like put on, I don't know, prosthetic nose and, and like upper lips so that she actually looks like a cat. She's wearing cat yeah. ears, but they also made her face look like a cat. Mm-hmm. I don't know what she looks like. And IRL. I'll, I'll explain why. Carl Lagerfeld has a cat named Choupette and he left 1.3 million pounds in inheritance to the cat okay. who now lives in Paris and has a full time housekeeper. Just the, for the Just cat. the cat. Just the cat. So that's weird. why she's dressed like really that. weird. OK. Anne Hathaway. Um, I have not seen Anne Hathaway in years. I can't even really see this. Um, do we just have one photo yeah. of her? Okay, tell me what's going on. You can see it a little better, Brie. It's kind of like um, fabric put together with like expensive safety um, pins. Safety pins, yes. Is the black a part of her dress or is that someone else's dress behind her? I, oh, that's a good... No, I think that's someone else behind her. I yeah. could be wrong, but sh- I think she looks amazing. I mean, she she does look She great. looks like she has not aged one day. Yeah, that's rude. <laughs> um, okay. Just, I mean, I don't like the safety pins, but I'll probably say a six just because she herself looks great. Yeah, I'd give it a seven. Okay, last one. Last Jared one. Leto. <laughs> what? Is this Photoshop? No, it's not. Is he the? Is he being the cat that inherited the one point three <laughs> yeah, million? He's being Choupette the cat. Okay, so that's what <laughs> Choupette looks like. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, okay. He's literally just wearing a bodysuit. Yeah, furries everywhere. So excited. <laughs> um, he's wearing like a bodysuit of a white cat. It looks, it looks like someone like a sticker on the screen. Like it looks photoshopped. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, and then he takes off the head of the suit and he gets a picture of himself. He's got a lot of eyeshadow on. I kind of respect it because it's like low effort, you know? Low effort. And maybe he's like kind of making a mockery of the whole thing. I don't know. Um, I mean, 
sure. You know what? Ten. 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 Agreed. Ten. Ten. Um, All right. That's all we've got time for today. Lots of nonsense to put punctuation on our very serious and important episode. Just some unimportant things for your viewing, listening pleasure. All right. We will be back here tomorrow. See you guys then. Mm -hmm.